Glory to you, Almighty, for gathering us today. Give us the fortitude to conquer life's challenges. Inspire us to excel and to be upright in everything we do. Guide us to remain united in diversity, to serve and love one another. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Alejandro Rosas Professorial Lecture Series is a yearly celebration during the university's Foundation Week as organized by the Institute of Arts and Sciences to honor its alumna and former dean national artist Alejandro Rosas. To us in the literary field, Dr. Alejandro Rosas is best known for the chicken with a questionable gender. Here in FEU Do, he has managed to teach along with Antonio Abad, and through his initiative, he was also able to grant national artist Jose Garcia Villa an honorary doctorate as well as to teach here. Until today, the same commitment is continued with former lectures from Jan Blanco, Jose Javier Reyes, Grisebio Jonathan Alejandro, Julio Tejanqui, Vicente Belisario Jr., Salvador Santino Rahilme Jr., Jesus Alfonso Datu, Juni Del Mundo, and earlier this morning, Cecilia Reyes, and now, Dr. Cristina Pantoja Hidalgo. The legacy of Alejandro Rosas continues here in FEU to flourish with its aim to be an avenue of recognition towards the distinguished professor, uh, professionals in their expertise in the diverse disciplines of arts and sciences. In this spirit, the sixth Alejandro Rosas Lecture Series aims to continue its legacy to cultivate members of the FEU community in academic excellence in the respective fields that they have chosen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the sixth Alejandro Rosas Professorial Lecture Series. I am Cecilia Bettina Elmido, a faculty from the Institute of Arts and Sciences, Department of Language and Literature. Before the program starts, a few reminders. Please keep your devices in silent mode or your mics for our online guests muted during the event. Food and beverages are frowned upon here in the venue. Please avoid talking loudly during the event. And if you have questions and concerns, kindly take note of them. And the ushers will assist you during the roundtable discussion after our speaker completes her lecture. And now to formally open the event, may I please call Dr. Emmanuel Gonzalez for the opening remarks. Sir Manny. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, colleagues, and friends. It is with great pleasure and excitement that we gather today for the sixth Alejandro Rosas Professorial Lecture. This distinguished series continues to be a beacon of intellectual discourse and scholarly exchange, honoring the legacy of one of the Philippines' most eminent literary figures. Today, we are privileged to delve into a theme that resonates deeply with the fabric of literature, culture, and society, women in English literature. 
As we embark on this journey through the annals of literary history, we are compelled to explore the multi-faced roles, representations, and contributions of women in shaping the literary landscape. From the pioneering voices of the past to the contemporary trailblazers of today, women have wielded the pen with extraordinary grace, insights, and resilience. Their narratives, characters, and perspectives have not only enriched the literary canon, but have also provided profound insights into the human condition, challenging norms, and fostering empathy and understanding. Through this lecture, we seek to celebrate the diversity and richness of women's voices in English literature, while also interrogating the complex intersection of gender, power, and identity. It is timely opportunity to critically examine the triumphs and tribulations of the female characters, authors, and readers, and to amplify their voices in our ongoing dialogue about literature and society. As we honor uh, Alejandro Rosas' enduring legacy, let us embrace the spirit of inquiry, curiosity, and inclusivity that he so passionately advocated. May this lecture inspire us to continue championing diversity, equity, and representation in the world of letters, and to recognize the invaluable contributions of women in the tapestry of human experience. Without further ado, let us embark on this intellectual odyssey, guided by the wisdom and insights of our distinguished speaker. Welcome to the sixth Alejandro Rosas Professorial Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you immensely for those kind words, Sir Manny. We also would like to acknowledge and thank the presence of Ma'am Gianna Montenola and VP uh, Wen, uh, VP Wen Reyes. Uh, I am certain, like me, you are also looking forward to listen to our speaker. May I now please call on Associate Dean Francis Esteban to introduce her. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon. It is my honor to introduce to you this afternoon our distinct speaker. She has a PhD in Comparative Literature from the University of the Philippines and an MA in English Literature and BA in Philosophy, Manya Cum Laude, from the University of Santo Tomas. She is a writer of fiction and nonfiction, a critic and a literary scholar with more than 40 published books, including three novels. And in 2020, she received the Southeast Asia Write Award for Literature an international award granted by the Royal Family of Thailand. She has also received several national awards for, little, for a lifetime achievement, including the Carlos Palanca Dangal ng Lahi, granted by the Carlos Palanca Foundation, the Gawad Balagtas Award, granted by the Union ng Mga Manunulat ng Pilipinas, or UMPIL, and the Parangal Hagbong, granted by the UST Varsitarian. She has received awards for individual works like the Carlos Palanca Grand Prize for her novel Recuerdo and the National Book Award granted by the Manila Critics Circle and the National Book Development Board for several of her short story collections and creative nonfiction collections. She has also been nominated for the National Artist for Literature Award. Our speaker has worked as a teacher, writer, and editor in Bangkok, Seoul, Yango, or formerly Rangoon, the New York City, and in Manila. She is also a seasoned academic administrator, having served, having served in the University of the Philippines as Vice President for Public Affairs, Director of the UP Press, and Director of the UP Institute of Creative Writing, and in UST as Director of the UST Publishing House. At present, she is the director of the USC Center for Creative Writing and Literary Studies and Professor Emeritus at UP Diliman. 
She continues to teach graduate courses in creative writing and literature at USC and UP. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you this afternoon's speaker, Professor Cristina Pantoja Hidalgo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Diego, for having invited me here. Good afternoon to my friend, uh, Gianna Montinola. Uh, I'd like to begin by telling you a story. Uh, it's about uh, two girls called... Um, what were what uh, Paz. Paz and her sister, Felicidad. After the Philippine-American War ended in 1902, one of the things that the Americans did is establish a public school system. I think you probably know this. But you may not be aware of the effect that this had on the Filipinos of the lower middle class and the poorer classes who would never have been able to afford to send their children to Manila to be educated. The schools that the Americans established were quite different from the stern Spanish system uh, that was uh, established before the Americans came. Paz's father, a small landowner from San Isidro, Nueva Ecija, was shocked at the coeducational system of education, uh, so the coeducational system up in these uh, public schools, and even had doubts about the wisdom of sending his daughters to school. The popular notion was that girls who learned how to read and write would acquire very quickly sweethearts. Uh, you're not even familiar with that term anymore. It means boyfriends or girlfriends. No? Boys were supposed to learn a profession the most popular and highly appreciated being law and medicine. As girls were not expected to earn money from a profession, since they would get married and their husbands would take care of providing for them, um, they were expected only to finish, they were sent to a colegio to finish maybe only two years of school. In the turn of the, if the, in the, turn of the century, if a Filipina could pray, embroider, and keep house, she was ready for the, every woman's destiny, which was marriage and motherhood. The American public school system changed values overnight. As the girls came into competition with the boys for the first time in the Philippines, they found to their astonishment that they could not only compete with the boys, but they could beat them. Felicidad Policarpio was one of those girls who enjoyed being pitted against the boys and beating them. Moreover, the girls who completed fifth and sixth grade were hired to teach first grade pupils at the handsome monthly sal salary of 12 to 15 pesos a month. At the time, that was considered handsome. And uh, suddenly, a whole new world was open to them. But this was not to last for long. Her, her sc Felicidad's schooling ended abruptly when she began to receive love letters from her classmates. The father chose to punish her for receiving the letters, even if she had not answered any of them. And the punishment was to pull her out of school. He was more lenient with Paz, the younger daughter. Uh, and from the start, she loved learning. Uh, I quote from her here, I was, so, I was an eager beaver in school, always raising my hand and know it all. In fact, she also asked so many questions that she earned the name Pasitang Daldal. She got excellent grades, but her father never pressed her. 
She, she breezed through school and graduated valedictorian. And her father must have been secretly proud of her because he offered no objection to her moving to Manila to continue her education. She enrolled in UP, finished a four-year course in three and a half years, and graduated summa cum laude with a double major in journalism and education while teaching three subjects in PWU. This lady, Pas Policarpio Mendez, uh, became my mother's teacher, English teacher in UP, uh, Diliman, yeah, UP. No, it wasn't in Diliman there. It was in Manila at that time. Um, I told you that story to give you a kind of background to what I'm going to say next. No, I, it, My point is to stress the fact that until that time, which was not very long ago, the beginning of the, the turn of the century, actually, no? the turn of the 20th century, girls were not expected to finish school. And certainly they were not expected to go to college, nor were they expected to have careers. Of course, things have changed now, and this is what my lecture will be about. So this is the topic, the role of women writers in the development of Philippine fiction in English. So what I will do is start with... Um, the 50s, please note, no, I'm only talking about Philippine literature in English. That's my area of expertise. I cannot talk about Philippine literature in uh, in Tagalog or Filipino. And I can talk about Philippine literature in Spanish that is the field of your, your dean. No? So I will stick to English. So uh, uh, who, who's handling the slides? New slide, please. Okay, so... This, let me talk about the situation in the 50s. Philippine literature in English was born in the UP campus. That's because, as you probably know, one of the things that the Americans did is establish the University of the Philippines in 1908. No? This was supposed to cater to the deserving poor. So it was for students who were considered intelligent but who could not afford uh, education in the private schools. So UP was for them. The, the medium of instruction, of instruction was English, as opposed to Spanish in UST and the older schools. No? So that's where the literature was born. New slide, please. So let me describe the literary scene. First, there was a big divide or division between writers in English and writers in Tagalog during that time. This was because the writers in English were, were based in academe whereas the writers in Filipino were contributing to uh, contrib contributing in, in installments to magazines, among them Liwayway. So they had uh, different backgrounds. And the other um, uh, characteristic of that period was that it saw the birth of the literary barcada. For example, the Veronicans, uh, the Ravens, and the UP Writers Club. Th this was... I mentioned this because it became um, this practice of belonging to a literary barcada, whether informal or formal, became uh, so, so established in the scene that even today, we all more or less belong to literary barcadas. Slide, next slide, please. In the field of the short, I mean, most, most scholars and critics are in agreement that it was in the short story that the Filipino writers in English excelled. Women writers were part of the literary scene from the very start. However, they were severely underrepresented. So in that landmark anthology, uh, next slide, no, yeah, that one, Philippine Short Stories, Fil Philippine Short Stories, published in 1975, but covering the period from 1925 to 1940, there were included 66 stories by 31 writers, and of those 31, only seven were women. Anong percentage yun? I do not know how to do math. So anyway, you figure it out. No, 33 writers and only seven were women. Uh, these writers were... Maybe you recognize some of the names. No? Paz Marquez Benitez is credited with having written the first modern Filipino short story in English. Its title is Dead Stars. And these other writers, uh, Estrella Alfon, Paz La Torrena, Lidia Villanueva, who later married um, Manuel Arguilla, 
and Ligaya Fructo Reyes. Of these women, only Estrella Alfon eventually made it to the so-called literary canon. The others kind of vanished. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is Estrella Alfon, and that is the title of her work, no? the, uh, the collected stories. This is a modern work. At the time when she was writing, nobody was uh, producing books. They just wrote stories which were published in, in magazines or textbooks. Next slide. Uh, Philippine Short Stories, uh, published in 1981, was the sequel to the first uh, Philippine Short Stories edited by Yabes. It covers the years from 1941 to 1955. Volume one has 41 writers, and of those 41, only eight are women. So the same percentage, no? And then uh, uh, these writers were Estrella Alfon again, Fructo Reyes, Villanueva Arguilla again, plus a few others, Victoria Montes, Aida Rivera Ford, Carmen Guerrero Nakpil, and Nita Umali. Of these women, the only one who became very prominent is Carmen Guerrero Nakpil, but she is an essayist. So we're not going to be dealing with her. I just mentioned it because she's also <laughs> the mother of Gemma Cruz Araneta, the first Filipino Miss International, or diba? <laughs> That's the, her claim to fame. Okay, next slide. Um, <clears throat> volume two has 47 writers. Again, only eight are women. And among these, the most highly regarded are Kirima Polotan and Edith Tiempo. Maybe these names are more familiar to you. Kirima Polotan was a journalist in the 60s and she published a very famous novel, The Hand of the Enemy. And Edith Tiempo published uh, a lot of novels and eventually became a national artist for women. By the way, Diana, uh, do you realize? <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> she's the one I know, so I will address her. That there, of all the writers, national writers, national artists for literature, there's only one woman, Edith Tiempo. I don't know how many men, but many, many, many men, and one woman. Diba? Yes, I've been nominated, but I lost to a man, of course. I lost to your dad, Jimmy Abad. Yeah, we were nominated at the same time. Of course, he won. He deserved to, man. He deserved to. Not because he, he was a man, but his achievements are remarkable naman talaga. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a photograph of uh, Kirima Polotan and Edith Tiempo in their younger days. No? And uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, wait. Uh, uh, let me finish saying something about Kirima and Edith. All were already very prominent during their time. The critic Ricardo de Metillo, who is also a poet, described them as minor writers. No? And one, Miguel Bernard, a Jesuit critic, simply lumped all the women together in one chapter. He wrote a book, uh, cri a Criticism of Philippine Literature in English. And there was a chapter for each man, like NVM Gonzalez, Nick Joaquin, Bienvenido Santos, Manuel Arguilla, but all the women in one chapter called Women Writers. Diba? So next slide. Uh, okay, this is again Karima and... Uh, uh, Edith, no, in their older years. By the 50s and the 60s, Polotan was clearly one of the most important voices in Philippine fiction and nonfiction. And Edith Tiempo had already the, produced the books in poetry, fiction, and nonfiction and criticism, which were eventually to win for her the title National Artist for Literature. Next slide. Maybe you're wondering what is the reason for this? No, why? were women so severely underrated that there were so few included whenever they made lists of writers, fiction writers. I think these were the reasons. First, women did not have the same access to education as men. You already saw that. That was my point in telling you that brief story about Paz, Policarpio, no? Mendes. By the way, you know what happened to Paz? She fell in love with a journalist and they got married. She gave up a scholarship, the Barbour scholarship to the States to marry him. And uh, this was very controversial. Half of the people praised her. 
Okay, so that's the first reason, no? And they were not, women were not really as well educated as the men. So how could they become writers? And they also did not, uh, they were not encouraged to have careers. In fact, my mother, who was also a writer, she is one of the first Filipina journalists. This was during the Commonwealth period, before the war. Before she was, uh, no, her mother, her, she died, her father died early. And her mother was a widow, raising her as a single mother. She would not allow her to go to work in journalism, work, go to work in a newspaper. All your colleagues will be men. This will be a scandal. In that time, they felt that way. So she had to ask her cousin, a man, to talk to my mother to convince her not to accept this job. My mother accepted it, however. But when she got married, she gave up everything for the family. <laughs> that was the story of the lives of women during that time. He, he, the young women in the audience do not follow that model. Huh? That is not a good model. The second reason, I think, for the underrating of women is that the women were admittedly overshadowed by the men. Their male contemporaries were Manuel Arguilla, Victor Rotor, Nick Joaquin, NVM Gonzalez, Francisco Arcellana, Frankie Shonilose. These men became national artists later. And then there's Gregorio Brillante. So they, they were really, they were, they were the best. And it, it was difficult to be, anyway, the women were not considered to be as accomplished as they were. And the third reason, and here's the part that maybe the men won't like too much. The reason for that is that the so-called literary establishment, meaning publishers, editors, anthologists, literary scholars and critics, judges of literary contests, were all men. And do men and women have different tastes? What do you think in literature? Can I hear from the young? Men and women have different tastes, absolutely. You can not, you know it for even in film, no? Even in TV series, no? So if the judges are all male, who will win? The male writers, of course, no? Okay. So uh, next slide. Who is angry? <laughs> are you, no, it, this is not an attack on men, promise. Uh, the stories produced for women were not so different from those produced by men. They were mostly realist stories, meaning wala pa mga fantasy, fantasy, you know? Realist stories. They were, they used fi the fictional techniques learned in the classroom and uh, based on models who were British and American. The themes tended to, toward what, what, what is usually referred to as universal themes. In other words, the search for identity, conflict between illusion and reality, or between city life and country life, nostalgia over a vanished past and lost love. But even then, those women, the few women who were writing, were quietly nonformists even then. Some stories which were taught in the classroom as simple love stories, to me, I mean, I was a student, when, I, when, we, when we read these stories by, by the women, our teachers taught them basically as love stories. But in fact, if you read them care, carefully, they actually had an underlying narrative which had to do with power. Also, they had to do with female sexuality. Even then, the women were doing this. You know? So they were rebels before the men became rebels. Anyway, that's my opinion. Next slide. From the 1960s to the, to the year 2000, the stories by the next generation of women explored darker worlds. For example, there were war stories. By the war here is meant World War II. No? And the most famous of these stories are People in the War, published in 1962, and The Wilderness of Sweets, published by, uh, in... Uh, 1973, by Hilda Cordero Fernando, which tell of the war from the point of view, not of the combatants. You know, this was a difference. Eh? There were other stories of war written by the men, and they had to do with the battles themselves, no? with the combatants. The, these stories by, these particular stories by Hilda were about uh, not just the civilians, but about adolescents. 
it was what it was like to grow up uh, during that war, to be a teenager during the war. She fell in love with a boy who was the hero of all her dreams, of course. I think she was 14 and he must have been 16. And they, they decided to elope, imagine that, 14 and 16. But he never showed up and she got sick. She thought she would die. Only later she found out it was because the guerrilla, he joined the guerrilla. He did not have time to tell her, so he left. And she thought he had changed his mind. Much later, he showed up on her birthday looking completely different. So different, she did not recognize him. He was tanned, he was much broader, and he had taken the risk of being caught by the Japanese to be able to come and say happy birthday to her. But they never again became... What's the term you use for it? Sila. Hindi na naging sila, ever. Because he changed too much. After fighting in a war, he was a man. And she was still a girl. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, the later stories became even darker. For example, um, Monsoon Collection is a collection of short stories by uh, Ninoch Karoska. And this contains a story about parricide. It's a girl who, who kills her own father because of the abject poverty that they suffer. The father is a drunk. He comes home and beats his family. And uh, this is during, it is set during the period of martial law. Do you know anything about martial law, guys? Do you believe the, the false story do you believe the false story do you believe the rewritten history which says that the period of martial law was a golden age do not believe any of it it was a very dark period in our story uh, thank you i'm glad that you agree uh so this story is said during martial law where there was curfew no now this drunken father of hers gets caught by, by the by the police or the military, the military, it's set in the province. And her mother sends her to go and find out what happened to her father. She knows what happened to her father and she knows what is going to happen to her. So she goes there to the to the to the camp, you know, where the soldiers are holding her father. And the exchange is she will sleep with them and they will release her father. That's the exchange. So the next the next morning, he, I mean during the night. The, 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 his guards come and release him and set him free. And the next morning, as he's walking home, she comes and she, she, uh, he sees her and he sees that she has some bruises. And instead of apologizing to her, he snickers. And so she gets a stone and kills him. She just gets a stone from the street and hits him on the head and hits him and hits him again. And that's the parricide in the story. Her brother comes looking for her and sees her all bloodied and knows what has happened. But he pretends he doesn't know. And he says, oh, he was killed by the soldiers. And she says he was killed. And then he says, don't worry about it. Come, we will, because she's bloody. We, we have to take a bath, he says. And she says, I want to go home. Yes, but we will take a bath first. And then as they're... Uh, bathing as she is washing herself he says to her now you can go to work in the big house you will become an indentured servant so this story is really about the what what happens to women in times like this in families that are abjectly poor so you see why i said it's a very dark story darker even than the war stories of hilda cordero fernando uh, now the next the next, oh, this is Hilda. Um, um, can you go back to that slide? I'm sorry that there's a slide there which includes me. <laughs> but the ma and creep, a creep you, Sonia. I, I was looking for pictures which, which would show how pretty she actually was. No, but that's the one that I found. Okay. Uh, then you have also stories that were you that used. I mean, we're talking about the stories of the sixties and the seventies now, no? Um, next slide, please. So some of them are story collections exploring themes not found in the earlier stories, no? For example, um, you have the Walk by uh, Joy Dairit, which are all experimental stories, and you have uh, Transient by Connie Maraan. 
which is the story of a child who's a victim of racism. Uh, can you the slide, please? And uh, that's the one of Nirochka Roska, the monsoon collection. Slide, please. I am so, yeah. Slide, please. Oh, these are my stories. These are stories. I included this because they are the first time that uh, the first collection of, of modern fairy tales. So this is a departure from the realist mode. No, I, uh, I, I, I wrote modern fairy tales. You don't need a picture because here I am. Okay, the next slide, please. Uh, this is the one I was saying, the transient and uh, joy no so these are you know you don't have i i this this uh powerpoint you have a copy of it here and you can make copies for them no this is just so they will make an introduction to the to the fiction produced by women writers no it is not comprehensive but it is an introduction which i think will be useful i cannot talk about each one there is no time no in a lecture like this okay the next one uh uh, this is also this is the other these are the, the book covers of the two books I mentioned. This is the walk by Joy Dayrit, and that I, and the other one is transient. No? Slide, please. <clears throat> okay, uh, there were also groundbreaking novels that were published during that time. You have uh, the work by Ninochka Roska, State of War. And this, this book covers several generations. It's like a history, counter history. Um, what do they call it in literary uh, criticism? Me uh, historiographic metafiction. You know, that's an example. And then uh, next. So this novel, State of War, no? that's the one. By the way, Ninochka visited here recently. We had there as a guest in U, in USD. You know, she's still fighting, you know, even if she's already almost 80. And then the next slide. This was the other one. These were breakthrough novels. Because see, we were we were at the time before this, not many Filipinos were be, even if we write, wrote in English, we were not being published in the US. No? We had no access to the publishers. Uh, the, the, the Filipinos who were published by American publishing houses were yun sila B, NVM Gonzalez and Bienvenido Santos, Carlos Bulos, and earlier generations. No, they were based in the U.S. But from writers based in the Philippines, people did not make it. Ninochka, she was based also in New York for, for a time. And that's when her novel was published there. And the other one was next, that's Jessica Hagedorn, who wrote Dog Eaters. Yun. So these two, they were groundbreaking novels and they kind of opened the gates for Filipinas who came after them. For example, the next, uh, I cannot talk anymore about what their plots are, no? Uh, you can, if you are interested, you can use this as a guide for what books to get from your library or what books to, to buy or to order. Um, okay, you have this other Filipina who was also published after Dog Eaters, Cecilia Manguera Brainard also based in the US. No? By the way, um, in the case of Cecilia Manguera, you see your state of war was historiographic metafiction. No? Dog Eaters was satire, postmodern satire, wonderful book, using different kinds of, uh, what do you call that, yung gay speak? In the body, gay speak in a particular way, colegiala speak, yung conyo, conyo speak. The novel is full of all these different types of uh, manners of speaking no? and different uh, registers of language. Itong si Cecilia Manguera Brainard, she uh, was the first to uh, have recourse to myth. The, the main character is a young girl. She has a yaya, and the yaya tells her stories about our Philippine mythology. Now, that's what her first novel is. <clears throat> and now we go to Philippine fiction today. I, this is still Cecilia Manguera Brainard. You know what? They, they come to visit. They come and speak to in UST. Do you want me to invite you? Yes, I will. Yeah, go ahead when they come. Or if you want also, you can invite them. I can introduce them to you and then you can have them speak here. No? They're very willing and happy to do it. That's the way I do it. Kasi ibig sabihin, nandito na sila. I don't have to pay for the pamasahe from the States. Wala naman kaming budget for anything like that, di ba? We have, what, 10,000 pesos yata is our honorarium nakakahiya if you are an American. They are already Americans, di ba? But they're willing because 
they want to be known also in their own country. So they are. In fact, our next speaker will be, but not a woman. Shall I tell you, even if he's not a woman? Yeah, see, Reinhardt Zamora Linmark, the author of uh, Leche, is his latest novel, no? I'll, I'll tell you about him, no? Okay. I think next month is when he will speak. Okay, so these are, I think, did we skip a... Uh, no, no, please, that's fine. Uh, the next one. This is the other one. Who's, she's the big one now. See, uh, see uh, Gina Apostol. This was her first novel. But she has many more. Next slide, please. Oh, that's mine. So mali yung slide. Right? Um, anyway, that, that's, that's uh, maybe I'll just tell you briefly what it is. Recuerdo is a six-generational family saga. But it's written in epistolary style using email email no so yeah the the there are letters supposed to be written by the mother to her daughter telling her the story that her mother told her about the history of their family i based it on my my mother's family my mother's family kasi the, the theme of the story is that the philippines is always at war and what happens is the men are killed and the women are left to carry on by themselves. This was the story of my 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 mother's family. the the first um, the first uh, ancestor was Chinese, pure Chinese, and he had one daughter who became the mistress of a priest. My mother, when I told her I was writing this, she said to me, "Ano ka ba? Why are you telling? Why are you telling the stories of the family like that? People will be your husbands. Nakakahiya sa mga asawa ninyo sabi niya." Why? Will they divorce us because we had an ancestor who was a priest? Anyway, so that priest, by the way, though, he was not a Spaniard. He was a Philippine secular priest. So he was part of that group to which Gomburza belonged. He was the parish priest of Quiapo, Jose Guevara. He was, my mother, because they hid that so carefully, did not even know his complete name. She only knew that he was Father Guevara. And he was the parish priest of Quiapo. Later, I found him in a history a book written by Luciano Santiago, who is a psychiatrist, but a historian by avocation. He gave me a picture of that ancestor. Guapo siya. Kaya pala, kaya pala my ancestress fell in love with him. Diba? But suddenly he disappeared. My mother didn't know what happened to him. And I found out what happened to him in the course of writing this novel. He was exiled to the Marianas. So they killed, they executed the three priests, yung Gombursa, no? Gomez, Burgos, and Sabora. And then there was another batch that they exiled to the Marianas, and they were never heard of again. Among them was this Father Guevara. Kaya pala, he disappeared from the stories that my family knew. I thought that they were ashamed of the ancestress, kasi after being the kabit of a priest, she went and married a Spaniard. So we were like, wow, we had an ancestress pala who was naughty, no? So she had first a Filipino priest and then a Spaniard. So our family has two branches. One of them look uh, Moreno or uh, Chinese like me, and the other bunch look mestizos. We did not know why. Only when we, when I uncovered this history of my family, did I discover why, pala. Okay, and 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 then so all the way that, that by the way, ito pa pala. This priest, uh, the, the Padre Guevara, had two sons. One of them was a violinist. That is the artistic gene. I like to think that's where I got my artistic gene from the violinist. The other one. Uh, was well he was a businessman but that violinist he went to he migrated he used to play the orchestra for the and tawag doon yung mga sarsuela you know the philippine theater he was a violinist for that and his girlfriend was the sarsuela star the yung bida the, the the female star they got married and then they went to naga because it was a booming town and they he set up a theater company there but he joined the katipunan so he was arrested and executed in Bagumbayan. So the father of the priest who was exiled was executed. This was the father of my Lola. So this, this story traces it all down to my generation and the people who were killed during before the declaration or during the declaration of martial law. 
So there, after the, that one, kasi there's World War II and the men killed by the Japanese. No? And then the next, the men killed by the Marcos administration. So it's the story of war. So kaya generational saga. Uh, this is the old, the old edition. That's the new one. Uh, next, please. Okay, these are the uh, the new, the the other stories. Okay, um, can you look at the next slide, please? Okay, this is one of the most uh, well known of the new novels. It is crime fiction. It's a crime novel. Uh, written by F.H. Batakan, who is based in Singapore, but she used to be my student in UP. This novel won the palanca, and then it went on to be picked up by an American publisher who asked her to make it longer. And that longer version became the basis of a movie, and it was shown here. The movie was shown here. The detectives are unusual because they are Jesuit priests. By the way, it became a bestseller. You know why? Ateneo made it required reading, right? Because the hero was a Jesuit priest. He was a Jesuit priest who was a forensic pathologist or something like that. And then his partner was a, a, a psychologist, I think. And these two sold, uh, it, it was um, a serial killer. And uh, anyway, that, that book is a very good one. So, and then the next one, this one is very different naman. Ay, please, never mind that. Can you, next slide, please. Uh, okay, this one. This is very different. It is what is called chick lit. Do you know what that is, chick lit? Very short romances, but they are set in, in the urban setting and in the corpor corporate structure generally. But hilarious, actually. It uses the language of the, that, that, that crowd. Anyway. Uh, Tara Serin, you know, we used to, I used to take, when I was head of the UP Press, I would bring the, we would have a tour, book tour, no, to the provinces, to the different UP campuses. We would bring uh, three writers who, who were published by UP. The one who was mobbed all the time was this one, because she was pretty and she was always wearing mini skirts. So, so when she would arrive, everybody would crowd to there where she was. Ah, but, and I found out something also, you know, this is a sad story. In the other UP campuses, the students do not have money to buy books. The only ones who could buy, and they were cheap, huh? No, no more, uh, they, we kept the price at 200 and below. And still the students couldn't buy. The ones who would buy would be the teachers, salary deductions pa. So parang nakakaawa talaga. Uh, in fact, one time when I took, I think, your father and uh, Erwin Castillo, Erwin Castillo is an advertising man, said, Naku, I felt he, he witnessed a debate between two students to decide whose book to buy, his or Butch Dalisa's. Because one wanted one, the other one wanted the other, but they could only afford one book. So he wanted to offer to buy both na lang and give it to them as a gift. And, so that's one sad thing that we need to keep in mind also that they cannot afford the books. Um, next, please. Okay, this is the, the other, the, this is again Gina Apostol that I was saying is the, the, the most well-known now. She has so many novels, no? The most recent is La Tercera. But my own favorite is Insurrecto. It is about the... Ano yung Balangiga massacre, no? There. Different versions of it. Uh, next. I'll go quickly over this na, kasi these are all names naman, eh, no? So this one, oh, that's, that's uh, Gina when she appeared in UST. Next, please. Uh, Merlinda Bobis, another writer who is uh, internationally, internationally published. I think she's based in Australia. Next, please. I cannot read. Sino ba yan? Ah, Merlinda Bobby still. Uh, next slide, please. Mango Bride. She is, uh, I think her husband was your guest, Jody Blanco. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, the lecturer. Yeah, he's, the, she is married to him. When he was, you know, when he was just a new graduate teaching English 
he came to the Philippines and applied in the English Department of UP to teach. So he was hired. And then he fell in love with Marie V, who was a student. Not his student, but a student. And then they, uh, they got married and they went abroad to live. This is her novel, Mango Bride. It is a no, marvelous realism. It's the style that it follows. Next, please. Uh, this one, this is a very interesting crime novel because the detective, you know, it's, you, you know the reason why do we have, we do not have detective fiction here. Why do you think? Nobody trusts any detectives here. No, They do not solve anything. So you cannot make them into heroes, right? And here you, you see that picture. Uh, Mabek was uh, uh, Diana's uh, classmate in this, uh, uh, yeah, the writing group that we had. Mabek is Chinese, pure Chinese. This is a story about a Chennai matron who has, wants to solve a kidnap attempt on her son's life. But nobody, the, the detectives she hires are incompetent. So she decides to solve it herself. So the, the hero of this story, the detective of this story, is the woman herself. So it's, it's, it's really very interesting. Next, please. Uh, this is a, a young writer who's already written. Her books are all available, by the way, in fully book. She does speculative fiction. So that's, that's uh, big with the young people. Uh, next, let's go. Eliza Victoria, that's the same, no? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Jessica Zafra. You, you, we know Jessica Zafra mainly because of her humorous essays, no? But she also writes fiction, and this is her first novel. It's a comic novel. So the only, the very few, the only other comic, you know, Filipinos are very funny, Diba. We like making jokes all the time, even when there's an earthquake or any kind of disaster, jokes will uh, emerge, you know. But in our literature, we are not funny. I think we think that when it's literary, it should be dead serious. So it's all dark and gloomy and ma'angst. But Charles Son Ong, something about the Chinese. Charles Son Ong is also Chinese. He writes comic fiction. But among the women, this is the only one I know who does it, see Jessica Saf. By the way, her style influenced a whole generation. There was a time when all the young women I knew, my students and not, all wanted to write like Jessica Safra. I think that's it. Let's go to the last uh, slides. Uh, this is, these are just short stories, short story collections. Slide, please. Okay, so we have obviously come a long way from the time of uh, Paz Marquez Benitez. We now have women writing in all the different genres, in all the different styles. Um, what do you think is the reason why there is a change? Because today, I would say that there are as many women as men uh, publishing and winning awards. Now, these are my uh, theories about why this has happened. Slide. Uh, slide. Okay. The first reason is that um, the, the establishment of creative writing as a discipline in the universities. No? The fact that you can uh, major in creative writing from undergraduate to PhD level has produced quite a number of writers. In our classrooms, by the way, the women definitely outnumber the men. I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think the men are all expected to go into professions that will earn a lot of money. Tama ba ko? I do not know what the students think. They are not responding. Uh, you're expected to become engineers or businessmen or economists or whatever. Doctors and lawyers, the men, but the women, kung gusto mag creative writing, it's eh, okay na lang, ano? So, I, I, I think even my own father, when he never objected to my becoming a writer, he thought, eh, okay, she'll be like her mother, but his son, his son, he had, had to be an engineer. And my brother only wanted to be a drummer naman. 
That was his ambition. He wanted to be a drummer. And my father said, what? A drummer? Who do you think you are? Ringo Starr? You are no Ringo Starr. Terrible. I, I thought that that was very cruel. And in fact, it, it I won't go into my brother's private life, but I thought, uh, I, I blamed my father for that. I thought, bakit? Kung gusto mag-drummer, di ba? Yun. Anyway. Um, okay, the, the second, so first that there, there is a discipline called creative writing. The second reason is that there are now very many more publishing houses. Is it there? Yeah, okay. There are many more publishing houses and um, may, both mainstream and indie. No? The mainstream publishers are the university presses plus Anvil and uh, Avenida, Avenida Books. And then you have the indie the next slide. There is now an indie collab. The small independent publishing houses have formed a collab so that they, they exhibit together. Because when you exhibit in a book fair, mahal yung rental for the booth. But if you are many and you you do it together, then it comes out cheaper. No? And then uh, the, the third reason, the next reason is that the women have played an important, oh, by the way, the, the publishing houses overwhelmingly headed by women. From um, Ateneo Press, for a for long time, it's all there. No? Uh, and then the independent publishers, Mil Flores is also headed by a woman now, Andrea Passion. And finally, the, the women also are judges of literary contests now. So the literary establishment now has as many women as men, if not more. And that these are the factors, I think, which explain why there are more women writers and more women successful writers. So it's all related to our history. And I guess that's it. That's all I have to say. I'll be happy to take questions. I'll sit here. Okay. Uh, may we ask everyone to move to the center for a very quick photo with our distinguished speaker?
Everyone, please settle down. We are still not yet done with the event. Thank you so much. okay hello okay what an honor it is to be blessed with such insights into as elaine shuwater may call it her stories of philippine literature thank you so much for that mom jing so um we have prepared several questions for now the open forum. The floor is now open for the roundtable discussion. In case that you have some questions that you would like to ask audience towards Mam Jing, anyone? Yes. If you also are shy or unable to construct the question, you may also write it down and give it up to us here. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Hilgago. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. At the beginning, um, before you spoke, you, you were well introduced by one of your colleagues, one of my colleagues in front. Um, and we, we learned about your academic background. Later on in the presentation, you mentioned the amount of, um, the number of Filipino universities offering uh, academic courses in, um, in writing. My question is this, to be a good Filipina, Filipina writer, is it necessary to have training and uh, education in writing or can one, um, just just uh, naturally write and become a writer like like you like those several ladies wonderful ladies you mentioned thank you uh the, the answer i think is is easy you know you don't need to get a degree in writing what uh, all those writers that i mentioned sila nikokin kirima polotan or gilda cordero fernando even myself we did not have degrees in creative writing. The, the degree did not exist. But the one thing we did was we read a lot. Because you only, you only learn to do something by practicing, right? You want to be a chef, you, you have to watch the, the chefs and how they cook, right? You want to be a tennis player, you watch tennis players. So the degree is not necessary. But I'll tell you what it does. It, it hastens the process. Because from the beginning, you're, you're in second year and you're submitting your pieces for criti critiquing, your teacher's critique. So what would take you years to slowly develop, you know, I, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. This is the way to, this is better, this is a better technique. Your teacher will tell you. So the process gets short. And so we have students, under, we're still undergraduates, already winning literary awards because of that, I think. So that's the advantage, but it's not needed. Yes, I agree uh, with what Mam Jing has said. Um, to follow up with that question, if there are some questions also from the audience, what can be done for women writers that you have mentioned, like Kirima, Polotan, Estrella Alfon, or even yourself, Mam Jing, who have reached a quintessential milestones in their careers in for you to be successfully become national artists in literature? What can be done? Well, <laughs> first, you have to be nominated 
So uh, usually I think it's more, it's helpful if the entity that nominates you is a university because it has the capacity to do the research that it takes to present the nomination. Because you have to look for all the things you have ever written from the time you were a baby, if you were a baby who could write, and everything that has been written about you. This has to be compiled in boxes, and nobody has the time to do that. No? But a university might, might be able to assign it to people. But without that, walang pag-asa. Actually, somebody told me that you can pay for it, not for the award. You can pay somebody to do the research. And it costs a lot of money. So, yes. whether you be a man or a woman, pareho naman ang process. Thank you, Mam Jeng. Are there questions from the audience? That's really sad. If no one asks a question, that means they were not interested in what you said. I have questions, Mam Jeng. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I'm very interested, especially for this next one. Mam Jing, I am very much intrigued with your writing, especially towards your contribution to nonfiction. One of your former students, whom I lovingly called my wife, Dr. Ronald Baitan, how does finding the right tone work? And how is said tone distinct from fiction? How is the difference uh, in tone, in terms of tone, the difference between fiction and nonfiction book? I think the main difference is the point of view. Because when you're writing fiction, you can use different points of view, diba? You, I don't know how, how much you, you understand about point of view in stories. You know, you can tell it from the first person point of view, like I, or from the third person point of view, no? which is uh, detached, no? uh, omniscient or third character limited you know, for fiction. You can tell the story from the point of view of any of your characters. But for nonfiction, there is only one possible point of view, yours. Because eh, it's nonfiction, meaning you're talking about yourself, about your life, your experiences, the people you know, the experiences you have. So the point of view will always be the I. The tone will vary. Tone means attitude, no? Attitude towards your material, attitude towards your readers. That will vary depending on what kind of nonfiction you are writing. So, for example, uh, if you're telling the story of, uh, of, of, of your first heartbreak, your tone will probably be nostalgic or sad if you're telling the story of how you one time were, I don't know, you became a beauty queen. <laughs> I cannot imagine. Ano kaya ang tone kung beauty queen ka? It will be triumphalist. <laughs> and it depends on your emotion. No? So it will vary with your emotion. But the point of view will always be first person. Thank you so much for that wonderful and very, very insightful answer, Mam Ma Jing. Mam Nika, you have a question? Hello, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Hello. Um, what is your advice to aspiring writers now, considering we are in the age of AI, chat GPT, digital technology, social media, and all? So what is your advice to young writers? Because I, I know that not everyone, not all students uh, read anymore. The, the genuine reading, meaning reading from the book, hardcover, not, not through gadgets or anything. So what would be your advice to aspiring writers? Can I first answer without talking about AI? Because AI is a game changer, no? But for just you want to write, I know what you mean. That they, is it true you don't read books anymore? No, no more. What do you read? What do you read, though? No, but my, okay, this, this is the question. Do you still read? Okay, what do you read? Tell me. This is a genuine question. And since I'm not the manual teacher, you don't have to worry about... Guys, so good naman ninyo. What do you read? Ano, no? Non-fiction. Where do you read it if not in a book? Saan ninyo nahahanap? Sa net? O sino yung mga nasumulat nun? Ah, you read my book. Ah, then you're... That's good. <laughs> you're guaranteed. <laughs> no, um... Here's my advice about that. It doesn't matter where you read, no? Whether you read on the net, you read on your phone, you read magazines, you read uh, whatever. Here's the thing, though. Make sure that what you're reading 
is good quality. Because you will learn by in the beginning by imitation. That's how we learn anything. Uh, even as I said, cooking, for example, you know, if your mother does not know how to cook, how will you learn? You cannot learn from her. Maybe you can learn from an aunt who knows how to cook. You have to watch. For for writing, you have to read. Where you do the reading is not that important. What's important is the quality. Now, you may ask me, how will I know whether the quality is good or bad? Ah, uh, That's it. That's where studying comes in. Because in your classes, you are taught what makes good writing. In your classes, in literature especially, or if you have creative writing classes, doon ninyo malalaman yung ano ang hahanapin para masabi na ito ay maganda. Halimbawa, yung mga Wattpad novels, most of them naman are trash. I have to say this. I'm sorry. It's not only Wattpad novels that are trash. So are the rom-coms on Netflix. Pero, pero, meron ding Wattpad na maganda. In fact, I know someone who crossed over from Wattpad to the Palanca Awards and won. But she told us how she did it. Pinalitan niya ang style niya. Sabi niya, ginawa kong mas malalim. Kasi ang Wattpad, siya mismo nagsabi nito, Wattpad writer siya, ang Wattpad writing ay mababaw. Yun ang nagugustuhan ng mga tao. Yun yung maraming followers. But she wanted to win the palangka to prove that she could do it. So she made it more malalim and she won. And after that, she became a resident, a, a writing fellow for the UP Writers Workshop. And there, she was accepted as an equal. So okay lang ang Wattpad, basta maganda ang pagkakasulat. Do not be satisfied with getting, I don't know how you express your uh, approval in Wattpad. Meron din ba mga likes? Ganun ba? If you, walang ganun. May, may mga comment section yan. Comment although section. I have no experience also. I, I don't know how it, how it happens, no? But he, uh, do not go by popularity. Go, kasi hindi ba, even in movies, yung pinaka-popular, that's not necessarily the most, the, the best, di ba? It has to have quality. Do not waste your time reading trash. Kasi what you will write is also trash. How can you produce something else if that's all you read, di ba? By the way, yung reading for fun, okay, I also read a lot of trash. I used to go to my father's room where there was a box full of what was at the time called pocket books. Yes. Mga detective stories. Later, I knew that that was trash. But when I was a teenager, I liked reading all of that kasi maraming sex scenes. Yung, yung, mga, yung mga ibang mga binabasa ko, wala namang ganun. So, doon ko lang nababasa yon, di ba? But later on, I outgrew them and I realized because I also went to school nga, I was a literature, I was a philosophy major, but I took a lot of units in literature and I realized the difference between good writing, bad writing and good writing and great writing. So to my students who are writers already, meaning nagpa-publish na, my advice is go for the top. What is the top? The Nobel. Diba? Yun na, if you're going to dream, you dream big. I dream that I will one day become a Nobel Prize winner. Maybe I will not, but I'll be trying to get there. And you know, we already have a Nobel laureate. We have Maria Reza, yes. who won the Nobel, not for literature, but for peace. And then we have Elizabeth, what's her name? Patricia Evangelista, Patricia. one of the top books to be produced this year. Some people are for killing. That's not fiction. That's non-fiction. And it's universally admired. So we can, we can get there. You know. But you make your, you aim high. Do not show your, your alibaba, you wrote, no? you wrote your story. Do not waste your time showing it to your mother. Your mother will praise it. Of course, because she's your mother. Do not show it to your boyfriend if he is no brighter than you. Make sure that his own grammar is better than yours. I tell my students in creative writing, kung ang mga boyfriend at girlfriend ninyo ay hindi marunong na grammar, makipag-break muna kayo sa kanila for the duration of this semester. Maghanap kayo nung magagaling para they will help edit your work. And after that, may grade na kayo sa akin. Kung hindi 
Balik na kayo dun sa mga dating mga bobo. Di ba? Kasi, kasi once you have seen what it's like to have a partner who is brighter than you, you will not settle for the bobo anymore. Di ba? Yes. The one who, who no, understands your jokes and laughs at them wants to see the same movies as you. That's the one. That's the one who will help you. Wag yung sexy lang siya and nothing else. Of course, mas maganda kung yung bright sexy rin, di ba? Of course. You, you can go for that. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, AD Kiko? Yes. Uh, Ma'am, so I was thinking, do you think that Filipinos have a natural inclination towards liking a kwento? That we have this tendency na if someone has a kwento, I would go there and listen to, to, to an extent that sometimes it's being utilized already in the spread of, well, in, in personal relationship, for example, in chismis and then in, in fake news. And in to that extent, what do you think is the role of Filipino literature, particularly those in your topic written by women, in amplifying and, uh, to, should I say, upgrading the public discourse of our cuento, of our cuentong bayan? Um, maybe first I should say that we are not alone. Filipinos are not alone in liking cuento and gossip. No, I think all people do. Uh, it's natural, I think, diba? Yung makarinig ng mga chismes, kahit naman Amerikano, Pranses, I think they're, they, they are also, you know. The more difficult question is, is there a way that Philippine literature can help to upgrade the kind of cuentos that we enjoy? You know, that is also my own my own dilemma. You know, I, I will tell you the truth. Yung mga libro namin, <laughs> uh, kunti lang ang nagbabasa. The readership of the, alam ni Gwen ito, the readership of the average collection of short stories or novel, whether in English or Filipino, is only at most, you, the print run, di ba? For the publisher. How many books are you going to print? Let's say I accept your book. I will publish it, meaning I will invest my money. How much will I invest? I will invest only as much as I think will be bought by people. So the number of print caps is only 1,000. Kung poetry, 500. Yun yung, anong population ng Pilipinas? 100 million. Isn't that pathetic? Out of 100 million people, 500 will buy your book. Or 1,000 only. Why? Is it because Filipinos do not like to read? I think you have just proven that it's not true. You are reading. So why do we not buy the books? I think because most of the books are not what the people want to read. No? They're too difficult. Or uh, my, my husband set, uh, set up, before he, my late husband, before he died, he set up a publishing house called Mil Flores. Mil Flores Publishing. It is not owned by, by me anymore. I sold it now. But at the time, he set it up. He was investing his own money, so he needed to sell. So he couldn't just accept books just because the writer is very famous or he's supposed to be a very good writer. He had to invest in books that would sell. So what did he buy? First of all, he published books in Filipino kasi mas malaki ang audience for Filipino. That's undeniable. They, 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 there are more people who speak and read and write in Filipino. That's the first the second is, they should be short. Ayaw nung makapal, hindi nila bibilhin. So maikli and light and preferably funny. So that was what he, he commissioned those titles. I helped him there. Since I'm, I was teaching, I knew who were the young writers. So I would tell them, oh, you want to publish with me, Flores? My husband's looking for this kind of book. And I edited some books. For example, one book I edited was called Sleepless in Manila. It was uh, an anthology. I asked for people to contribute about people who cannot eat, those who are insomniac, mga insomniac, yung hindi makatulog ba? Kasi ako insomniac eh. And so many writers pala are insomniac. So they contributed essays. And I said, if you can be funny, better. That book sold very well. I think you, they, that went to ab about 3,000. That's big na if the average is one. At least yun, 3,000, no? Tapos siya, nag-publish siya ng mga, alam ba rin yung sabong? Yes. Sabong? Yes. My husband was a sabongero. 
yung bata pa, may hilig na siya sa sabong, nag escape siya from UP Elementary School to go to Disabungan in Marikina. Anyway, when he, he was a very big enthusiast of cockfighting, which horrified our daughters, by the way. Kasi yung mga anak namin, woke. Diba? That is cruelty to animals. Diba? Totoo naman. But their father, that was his real hobby. So he wrote books about cockfighting. Yung talagang non-fiction, no? how to breed, how to fight, how to... Alam niyo yung tari? Pinatalian, tari, how to do that, mga ganon. They sold in the thousands. Anvil was the first one to publish those books. Later, kinuha na niya yung rights. Ginamit niya for Mil Flores Publishing. Tapos sumulat na rin ng fiction. Yung fiction, invented na. Pero yung mga readers niya nung non-fiction, akala totoo rin itong mga fiction. Yung isa nga eh, the, the, many, the hilarious life of Nestor de Vinagracia. That was the title. Yung Nestor de Vinagracia, fictional person yon character yon pero yung readers na sa bungero akala totoo so tumatawag sila sa bahay they would ask to speak to him and then they would say pwede ho bang bumili ng mga lahi nung nung binibreed ni Mr. De Vinagracia so sabi niya ay ano ho yan fiction oo nga ho gusto kong bumili so in the, for the average reader pala walang distinction yung fiction and fiction kung tungkol sa sabong because they're interested in sabong they will buy that so that's one way maybe where we could kayo since you you are you read you know what it is which the people of your generation like to read yun ang isulat ninyo do not try to write what your teachers like to read kasi your teachers are old so so iba ang taste nila di ba ako rin in in one of my one, there was one time i was in a i was in a seminar tatlo kami apat yata kami si Jimmy Abad si Butch Dalisa si Charlson o ako kami apat no and then our audience of young people after our lectures they they were asking questions one of them asked as she said, she was a Wattpad writer, sabi niya. I'm a Wattpad writer. I am already sold in national bookstore. One of my books has been made into a movie. But I want to be a writer like you. Sa How do I go about it, sabi niya. Sabi ko, why would you want to be a writer like me? I am old. I belong to a different world. You would not be able to write like me even if you tried. No? Iba yun, iba yung worlds natin. Just like I cannot, cannot be a writer like you. We live in different worlds. You go ahead being the kind of writer that you are, but you try to improve. How? By reading other young writers who might be better writers than you. For example, Lord de Vera. Kilala ba ninyo yun? Lord de Vera is a rock band frontman. Diba? He's a TV personality. But he has written a novel. It is called Super Panalo Sounds. It is about a band. The only novel in English about a rock band. In fact, ako nag-publish nun sa USD. Akala ko baka maano ko eh. Masitahin ako ng mga pare kasi puro nagmumura. Yung mga dialogue nila puro mura. They're members of a band. Puro sex, sex drugs, and rock and roll. So sabi ko kay Lord, paano kung tawagin ako ni Father Rector at tanungin ako, bakit mo ba pinablish ito? Ano yung sasagot ko? Sabi niya, sabihin nyo, these are morality tales. Kasi namatay yung isang band member. But to, in fairness to the priest, they did not interfere with it. It's sold and it's still selling. So Lord is a good model. Yun. So maghahanap kayo, mas kilala ninyo kaysa ako. Sino yung mga writers na kilala, pero may mga, I mean to say, they write the things that you enjoy, but they have a good reputation as writers of quality. Meron, I'm sure there are. Yang si Eliza Victoria. She sells very well. Puro ano yan, fantasy. Alam ba rin yung trese? Yes. Oh, can you, why don't you do that kind of thing? Binili na ng Netflix, di ba? Budgetan and Kajo Baldissimo, no? Yung ganyan, yung kung ano yung popular, ano yung gusto ninyo, ganun ang gagawin ninyo. But, yung nga, your models must be good. Thank you so much for that, Ma'am Jing. Other questions from the audience? Yes.
Hello po, ako po si Rina Antienda po from Hi. BS po. Ano po, bag- Bachelor of Language and Literature po, second year. Um, for my question is, um, I read this, I read this and heard this from the most of the writers po, eh, especially po, po sa mga fan fictions po. Eh. Um, is it necessary to be a uh, correct, um, grammarly perfect po in terms of the stories po? If it is, um, why po? And I have a problem rin po sa Uh, po, eh, sa mga grammar din po eh. Kasi nga po, nga po, di pa tayo lahat perfect po, po sa mga grammar and such po. That's all po. Okay, I, I have to say that grammar is important. Kasi like, if you are a painter, di ba, you, you have to understand color and line and shape. Basic yun eh. Pag mali-mali ang grammar mo, pati yung meaning mo mapapalitan eh. Kasi di ba, for example, tense. It happened one month ago, but you use the present tense your reader will be confused. Now, if you have a problem with grammar in English, English grammar, my advice would be write in Filipino. Baka naman in Filipino, your grammar is okay. Di ba? If it's the language, your first language is Filipino, write in Filipino. Do not, I do not subscribe to the belief that English is superior to Filipino. I write in English because I was educated in English. Eh? During my time, You, the medium of instruction was always English for everything, from mathematics to history. To, ano. And if we spoke in English, siguro, in Filipino, siguro alam rin niyo ito, we had to pay fines. We were fined for speaking in our own language. I am a victim of that kind of education. That's why I write in English. Iba yung if you choose, no? you, you really want to become good in English, iba yon. Then you study it. No? You get a tutor. But If you like writing now and your only problem is that your grammar in English is bad, my advice is write in Filipino. In uh, UST, our creative writing program is bilingual. So if when I teach, uh, let's say, short story writing, I teach in English. But when it comes to writing, they are allowed to write in whatever language. Hindi naman whatever. Filipino, hindi naman pwede si Buano, Ilocano, ganun, no? Kasi there are no writers in those languages in UST. But we have writers in Filipino. So, pagdating ng workshop, I invite my colleagues who are writers in Filipino. Sila mag-workshop. Pag writers in English, ako mag-workshop. And you know, it has had a good effect. Some of our graduates are already published in Filipino. Kasi the UST Publishing House also publishes works in Filipino. So that's that's my advice to you. But grammar in Filipino, kailangan perfect ka. Huh? If you choose Filipino, you better be very good at it. Hindi pwede yung ungrammatical kahit anong language yun. That's the basic. Thank you so much again for that, Mam Jing. I think uh, we have arrived at the last Yeah, I think we have arrived at the last question. Now we that we are through with the conversation part of the event, may I now direct your attention if you haven't already? The books of Mam Jing, uh, this, her seminal works at are available outside and they are at 10% student discounts and you can have your copy signed after the event. For the next part of the event, may I please now call on uh, Dean Jago Abad, For uh for the closing remark, ah, uh, uh, sorry, uh Dean Jago Abad, uh Dean Jago Abad and Sir Manny Gonzalez for the awarding of the cer- certificate. Thank you. Hey, yes, um. See, allow me first to read this uh, certificate of appreciation to uh, Cristina Pantoja Hidalgo for her valuable contribution as speaker during the sixth Alejandro Rosses professorial lecture uh, with a topic entitled The Role of Women in the Development of Philippine Fiction in English, given this 7th day of February 2024 at FU Manila, signed by Emmanuel Gonzalez, Chair, Department of Language and Literature, and uh, yours truly. Dean of Institute of Arts and Sciences.
Thank you again for that. Uh, for the last part of the event, may I now please call on again Dean Jago Abad for the closing remarks. Thank you, Bettina. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our very special guest, uh, uh, Jing Hidalgo, for making it here, for gracing us with her presence. And of course, my colleagues uh, from the Department of Language and Literature, also IDS, I'm sure I've seen some of you here, uh, also my colleagues in the arts and sciences, and of course, you, the students. Um, now, what we do here for the Alejandro Rosses uh, professorial lectures, the idea is Alejandro Rosses to us no, is, um, is a lifelong learner. Uh, and, and this is what the lecture is really all about. And those who we invite, uh, including uh, Ma'am Jing today, no? um, there, what we'd like to uh, give, what we'd like to uh, offer no, is for them to be able to show what lifelong learning is about. And um, what uh, Ma'am Jing has, her, her lecture no, has shown us, listening to her, you just see the dearth of knowledge that she has. And it's, it's not something that, it's not work, for, for her anymore. It's it's something that she it's it's fun, but something that she loves to do. And for these professorial lectures, that's something that we'd like for you to take away. You know? um, here in the uh, academe, it's not uh, as students. I'm talking to you as as uh, students. No, um, it's not. It doesn't have to be very difficult. It doesn't have to be all about um, trying to be better. No. The idea is for you to have fun and for you to uh, keep keep doing it no, for the right reasons. Uh, and maybe one day you'll end up uh, also being uh, a guest in, in this lecture as Ma'am Jing has. So with that, I'd like to say thank you, uh, everyone, for your attendance. Ma'am Jing, thank you again for uh, being here and uh, delivering your lecture. Uh, pleasant afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you kindly for those words, uh, Dina Bad. We hope for uh, we hope also for the same impact and the same amount of excitement for the next or next year's Alejandro Ross's professorial lecture series. Finally, may I please ev uh, invite everyone to stand in the words of our national artist for literature, Nick Joaquin, the FEU hymn. Thank you, everyone. Again, if you haven't already, please get your copies and have them signed by Mom Jing Hidalgo. Uh, her books are available again outside and they are at a 10% student discount rate. Thank you, everyone.